So I'm going to talk to you tonight about the changing face of environmental policy domestically. <laughs> Obviously 2019 is the year of delivery um, for the current government that we've got. When they, um, when they, when they took, uh, took the seats essentially, they said we've got a big task ahead of us um, and our focus is going to be on a whole lot of issues, environment and the way that we manage our land um, being top of that list. But what I'm hoping that you'll get from tonight is a good understanding around the essential freshwater package. I'm hoping that you'll be able to understand the implications to you and your farming family and your community. And that rather than feeling disempowered, you'll feel empowered to be able to participate through this process. Work, uh, work with your communities to put into submissions and actually be powerful and having a voice at the table on, on what the suite of proposals should look like and the changes that you want to see coming through. I'll also provide you a quick update on um, and how Beef and Lamb will be able to assist you through this process and the resources that we will be providing for you um, and where to find those resources as they're being developed. While I'm going to focus tonight on essential fresh water, I have provided you with a bit of a PowerPoint and in that PowerPoint it does summarise some of those other policy changes that are coming through. So as I said, this is the year 2019 of delivery for this government around the environment. They've already released proposals on climate change and action on agricultural emissions in relation to climate change. What we're going to see coming through is a new national policy statement for biodiversity. We've already seen released a national policy, policy statement for soils. DOC has a biodiversity strategy for biodiversity also out. And we're likely to see changes come through also in relation to how we manage forestry activities through the National Environmental Standard for Plantation Forestry. Essential fresh water has been, been about a year in the making. The government earlier on heralded that it was thinking about this package of work and what it was likely to encompass. And they set up some advisory panels, the Freshwater Leaders Group being one, more a collection of uh, politicians and planners um, that represented sort of the interest across our primary organisations as well as our environmental NGOs. They also had an iwi leaders group, or Kahui Waimari, that provided a cultural aspect or lens to what was to come. They also were informed by a science and technical advisory group that at the end of the day, the proposals that we have in front of us are the government's. They've been written by the ministries, they've been informed by the advisory groups, but they were not written by the advisory groups. At the heart of the proposals is this aim to hold the line for water quality. This is to give effect to the national policy statement for fresh water and to set us on a journey of improving water quality across New Zealand. The proposals include three main elements. That's changes to the national policy statement for fresh water, which at its heart sets environmental bottom lines that regional councils need to implement through their regional plans. The other part of the proposals is a new national environmental standard which we're all very interested in. It has a large package in relation to how uh, they're anticipating we manage our agricultural land uses going forward to achieve environmental outcomes. And also 360 regulations, which is what they're called on stock exclusion. This means that they have immediate national effect and are, are to be implemented um, through, through by the regional councils and, and through their processes. Um, but there's no public participation in the National Environmental Standard and the 360 regulations once they come into force. There are national instruments which the regional councils then apply. So I'm going to start with something that we understand before I start to go into details that may be a little bit more foreign to us. So we all understand the concepts of stock exclusion from water bodies, right? There's no surprise that this has come through. It's been in the making for quite a period of time. The national government did consider this and they had draft proposals on the table, um, but they fell over because of concerns around unworkability practically on the ground. This government has picked up those proposals and essentially they've, they've um, put forward recommendations. On the face of them, they look pretty pragmatic, um, but as always, it's important that farmer underst farmers understand the details and actually participate to refine what's been proposed so that they are workable on the ground and pragmatic while achieving those environmental outcomes which are being sought. 
So this suite of proposals um, focuses primarily on lowland. These lowland areas are defined as around um, five degrees slope and are to be mapped. Um, in those areas, uh, the exclusions apply to water bodies that are greater than one metre wide and wetlands. Uh, dairy cattle are to be ex excluded from these waterways as long, along with no, uh, other cattle um, such as beef cattle, uh, pigs and deer. Um, and the time frames vary. So for dairy it's 2021 and for beef cattle and deer it's 2023. However, there's also an intensity factor that comes into play here. So for areas not within lowland environments, such as our hill country farms, there's also the exclusion to, or requirement to exclude dairy cattle from these waterways that are one metre wide or wider, um, and beef cattle and, and then those time frames that are also represented of those different uh, stock classes. For the areas outside of the lowland, there's a stocking intensity rate. At the moment, they're proposing 14 stock units per paddock, or uh, sorry, 14 stock units for farm, for the farm, whole farm, or 18 stock units per paddock. So those are the recommendations. But in the consultation document, while I'm putting forward, um, you know, the detail that's that sits behind the consultation document in the national proposed or draft national environmental standard and and the proposed or draft national policy statement. The consultation does open up and presents different options which are available, and it asks for comment from communities on particularly these thresholds, such as the 14 stock units per farm or the 18 stock units per paddock. Uh, so new fences also in relation to these stock exclusion provisions are to be five metres back from that waterway. So if it's a new fence, it's five metres back. If you've got an existing fence then, there's a time frame um, before that fence needs to be moved. However, that's not all. So that's the 360 regulation, but like I said before, there's a lot of devil in the detail around these suite of proposals. And so I just want to bring to your attention that through the National Environmental Standard, they're also proposing um, that farmers have to have a freshwater module to a farm plan. And in that freshwater module to a farm plan, which is required by all farmers essentially, there's a requirement to show how you're excluding all your animals from your water bodies. That includes sheep, the requirement is to show how you're excluding them, and you need to do that through, identify, through the identification um, through your farm plan, which is then audited. So what this means is that for all farmers, there's a requirement to show how you're excluding these animals from your waterways. It doesn't just apply to the one metre wide waterways, it applies to all waterways, and it captures all stock. We'll just take a bit of an interlude, right? So, <laughs> why would you manage animal? Right, why would you manage animals away from waterways? So, what we're concerned about um, in relation to keeping stock out of waterways is is the access of those stock or the standing of those stock directly in, in water bodies. So, we're worried about um, the fecal material that they deposit um, into the waterway or their urine, or the damage they can cause to riparian margins when you've got a large amount of animals, especially larger animals, um, congregated in those areas. It makes sense, therefore, that for intensive farming systems, I suppose, we're keeping these animals out of the waterways. However, um, if we're worried about what's getting into the waterways, the other um, route that we're worried about, and the one that's more pertinent, I think, to extensive farming systems, and especially systems that are on more diverse landscapes, such as hill country, it's not the animals per se in the waterway that concerns us. It's, it's the overland flow of things like the faecal matter that can get into the waterways. And what we know is that a fence doesn't stop a rain event, nor does it stop an overland flow. And so I think it's important to consider what we're trying to manage when we're thinking about these suite of proposals and the implications for not only achieving that environmental outcome, but on our farming businesses. And what we know is that um, if there's impacts on our farming businesses and their broad scale, uh, the research shows us that there's also that corresponding impact on our rural communities. I know that these slides are wordy. It's sort of done on purpose so that you've got that material that you can take away with you, and I'll just try and simplify it down as I go through this. So we're just moving now into the National Environmental Standard. And the National Environmental Standard covers uh, about six key areas. 
One of those key areas is to identify uh, farming activities that are deemed to be higher risk or at risk at farming activities. Um, that's land use change. And then the other one, and I think the one that we all know also is about our more intensive farming operations, um, especially if we're undertaken during the winter period. So this slide is just sort of summarising some of those proposals. Um, what, they're, what they're recommending through the National Environmental Standard is to identify uh, feedlots which are defined, other stock holding areas also defined, and sacrifice paddocks, as well as uh, intensive winter grazing on forage crops. And then they're proposing a regulatory framework around them. So for feedlots, where they've picked up essentially the international definition of feedlots, and for other stock holding areas, they're proposing that these activities are managed through a resource consent. For feedlots, this is not unusual. Our feedlot, we don't have many feedlots in New Zealand, I think we probably have one or two, and they're already consented, so this seemed appropriate, and then they've got standards around those consents. And so for feedlot, the definition is um, where stock are confined for more than 80 days in any six month period, and where food is brought into them, or to them. For other stock holding area, the definition is a little bit more broad, and I think this is where we're starting to probably see some issues in relation to how some of these activities are defined, and it'd be great to get farmer feedback on this so that they are actually applied in the right way and practical and deliver those environmental outcomes which are being sought. So other stock holding areas are area where stock are held for more than 30 days in any 12 month period or more than 10 consecutive days. So for these activities, consents required, and there's some conditions around those consents, the area needs to be sealed to a certain amount, and I just consider this to be similar to a clay base. Um, any effluent that's discharged needs to be appropriately collected and treated and then discharged through consent. Uh, they need to be 50 metres back from water bodies um, that and also uh, places where water may be taken for, for drinking water purposes. And these activities, they must have a freshwater module to a farm plan as well. And I'll talk about that freshwater module at the end, and it sort of summarises it, because I think this is something that we really need to turn our minds to. Sacrifice paddocks um, are defined as an area used to temporarily hold stock um, where pasture is likely to be impacted, where there may be devegetation and then where soil rehabilitation will be required afterwards. It's quite a broad definition. I can just imagine, well, I'm looking at your faces and can see the reaction to that. It pretty much covers a lot of the areas where we might have stock um, over those winter periods, especially when we have bad weather events. <coughs> For these activities, it's permitted essentially, but similar sort of standards apply. Uh, critical source, they need to not occur where there are critical source areas, and I can define that if, it, if, if we need to. Um, and then there's, they need to be set back from waterways as well. So winter grazing on forage crops. So these are rules that apply to um, those, those activities that we're undertaking. Essentially, there's a permitted activity pathway for areas that are considered lowland. So those are, are currently areas below 10 or 15 degrees slope. And for those areas, um, what's required under a permitted activity is that um, essentially good management practice or industry um, standards are, are met. We call them strategic grazing principles, and again, I can slow that down and, and talk about them, but they're, they're something that we're all quite commonly aware of, I think, and there's good resources on, uh, on the website, such as Beef and Lambs and Dairy and Zeds, about, about that, what that means. But it's also there's an, a restriction on the amount that you can do. We are seeing this already come through some, through some regional council plans such as Southland. Uh, what they're proposing through the National Environmental Standard is that those restrictions are 30 hectares or 5 or 10% of the property, whichever is larger, and they're open to uh, feedback on what those numbers should be. They're also proposing setbacks from waterways, and those setbacks need to be vegetated. So they can't just be pastured, but they need to be under some sort of cover. Uh, the setbacks proposed are five or up to 20 metres. Again, they're open to uh, feedback on what those riparian setback numbers should be. You need to protect those critical source areas, um, and that means probably not put the crop in them and, and exclude animals from them. So to quickly define a critical source area, it's those areas of the farm or paddock um, where you have uh, an overland flow which can then enter a surface water body and which can collect a whole lot of stuff like sediment or faecal matter or, or nitrogen or phosphorus. 
What we, from the research, um, what we know is about 20% of the farm or 20% of the catchment accumulates about 80% of what can flow over. So those critical source areas are really those areas of con congruence, but they need to be discharging to a surface water body to be considered a critical source area. However, there's, there's inequality in relation to what's been proposed through these rules. So while there's, while there's a PA pathway for, for lowland areas, I suppose, what they're proposing is that for hill country in particular, or those activities that can't meet these PA standards, that they flip through into requiring a resource consent. One of the requirements of that resource consent is that these activities need to have a freshwater module to a farm plan, and that they're grandparented to a historic extent of cropping. Uh, 2018 or 19 uh, it comes springs to mind there. And so this applies to hill country cropping irrespective of whether it's connected to a receiving water body and it applies irrespective of the potential environmental impact of that activity. Sprinting through, this is my favourite, uh, restrictions on land use change. So what they're, what they're proposing through the National Environmental Standard is also um, consideration of restrictions on land use change. And what this says, or what is proposed, what they are currently proposing, is that if you're intending to change your land use by more than 10 hectares, that is conversion of forestry into pasture, or intensification of your pastoral land use, such as from sheep and beef into dairy or dairy support, or if you're intending to increase the area under irrigation or into arable, then you need to apply for a resource consent. And that seems sort of appropriate if you consider, you know, maybe that intensification is deemed to be a, a higher risk activity. However, what it is proposing is that you can change your land use as long as the discharges from your land use don't increase. And so if we summarise that, it means that the higher your emissions are now or your discharges are now, then the more flexibility you have in, the, in relation to the farm systems you choose to use in the future. Or if you want to sell your land, the opportunities for that land to be used in a flexible way. What it means for the extensive guys is that the more extensive you are, or the more environmental mitigation you've already adopted, the least flexibility you have in relation to your farm systems and your choices for how you use that land. Shall we use the grandparenting word? This essentially grandparents extensive farming systems into their current systems. What we know if we think about nitrogen in particular, but these are the contaminants we're managing, but I'll just use nitrogen for example, is that for forestry I think they're discharging modelled about 4 kgs of nitrogen. That means there's pretty much no land use they can think about transferring to uh, where they could actually maintain or reduce the emissions of nitrogen. If you think about extensive farming systems, then what we know is the average for sheep and beef in particular is about 17 kgs of nitrogen. There's a lower range for our hill country of about 9 kgs. Those systems, therefore, there's very little flexibility in what you may want to change your land use into, even if you're thinking some horticultural activities. And what we know for our intensive farming systems, if you're using nitrogen as a proxy, for example, in Waikato, uh, the average for the dairy industry was about 50 kgs of nitrogen, up to around about 120 kgs of nitrogen leached as modelled by overseer. It means that those intensive farming systems have the greatest amount of flexibility to be able to transition, for example, into horticulture. I've just got a little bit more to cover as well. The other proposals through the National Environmental Standard is essentially restrictions or, or restrictions on nitrogen or a nitrogen cap. There's a number of proposals here. I'm just going to talk to you about one, but I do encourage you to go back and look at the consultation document because I think they have about three different proposals. I think there's also they're also proposing potentially a, a tax or a levy on, on fertiliser use. This is something that's also coming through in the climate change commitment or um, recommendations around how they manage uh, inputs into the system, such as fertiliser. I'm talking to you, about you, to you just about the one that's in the proposed or draft National Environmental Standard. And so this one identifies uh, specific catchments. I think there's about 13 catchments that it identifies and lists. For these catchments, what they're proposing is a nitrogen threshold or a nitrogen cap. The way that they're proposing to do this is that all farmers within that catchment provide an overseer budget to the regional council. The regional council then pulls out the dairy profile from the full suite of nutrient budgets that are provided to them. 
they pick either the 70th, 80th or 90th percentile in relation to that uh, dairy profile. If you're thinking about a profile, it sort of looks like a bell-shaped curve where you have low emitters such as, you know, about the 9 kgs and then, and then it comes up to an average and then you have a tail which um, is, is essentially the, the higher emitters up there. If you're thinking about the 70 percentile, it's sort of that, that, that end of that tail that they're trying to grab and bring down. So what they're saying is that if, if out of any land use, not just dairy, and we may have um, different, like sheep and beef systems, maybe if they're doing mixed arable or if they've got maize or they're on more vulnerable soils or higher rainfall also could be within that. Within that top range, those farms need a resource consent of controlled activity and they need to show how they're coming down to that threshold over time. However, if they cannot show how they're going to come down to that threshold over time, they can get another consent and they can just show best practicable option for the next five years in relation to their farming system and their reductions. That best practicable option, if you simplify that, it just means that you need to consider the economic viability or retain the economic viability of that farming system, so not do anything that might impact on that business. However, all other farms within that catchment are grandparented to their historic rate. They all need a freshwater farm plan, and I'm going to talk to you about what that requires in a minute. But one of the requirements of that freshwater farm plan is that you need to provide uh, what all your uh, emissions or discharges are. That's your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your sediment, and your, and your fecal matter. They call that microbial pathogens. You need to provide information on what all those emissions are, and then you need to show through your freshwater farm plan module essentially how you're going to reduce all those over time, irrespective of your starting position. So the freshwater farm plan, it's, it's proposed to be staged in relation to how it's rolled out. Those activities that require a consent, like the hill country cropping that I talked about, it's essentially applied immediately. For new farming businesses or practices being established, they also need a freshwater farm plan immediately. Uh, commercial vegetable will need one within two years. Um, and all other farms in New Zealand by 2025, essentially. The freshwater farm plan essentially asks for information, personal information about you and your farming and your farming business, just the normal stuff that we're seeing come through regional councils now in relation to their farm environment plan proposals, so nothing too, too daunting or different there. Uh, it also provides us for information around the farm boundary, your land management units um, and soils, so pretty consistent with some of the regional councils that are requiring farm environment plans. However, what it also requires, like I said, is, is that emissions budget, essentially, what are all your emissions across your potential discharges, what are they now, and then it requires that you document or record in your farm plan, essentially, what your actions are and your time frames for those actions, which will show how you're reducing all your emissions over time. These farm plans need to be signed off by a certified farm environment planner, and within 24 months of them being operative, they need to be audited by another certified individual. And that auditor will test them against, uh, essentially, the industry good management practices or principles that were agreed that were supposed to be um, outside of regulation, essentially just a suite of principles. They will, they will look at your plan against those principles, and they will also record or report on whether you, in fact, have actions, actions in place and timeframes which will reduce all your emissions. This approach is not linked to the catchment that you're in or the environmental issues that you might be facing. And it's not linked to what your emissions currently are. So through this sort of situation, you could get a property that is extensive, maybe leaching 9 kgs of nitrogen, like I talked about before, having to reduce from that, from that level. Um, I, I'll quickly touch on this and then I'll go, I'll go into what we think some of those economic impacts are, or, or just briefly. There's been a local government New Zealand publication uh, released, and that shows that under the suite of proposals, it, it, used, it uses a case study in the Waikato, but I can talk about the plan change one and the evidence that we saw in relation to that case as well. But for the local government New Zealand and the case study they looked at, it showed a 68% reduction in the land area under dry stock farming or extensive farming system. That was a conversion into forestry um, while more intensive land uses held their area. So that just gives you an indication of the magnitude of the sort of impacts that we could see coming through something like this. The last point I want to make is that there's also a, a, a greater focus on wetlands. Uh, I do think this is appropriate. Uh, we've only got like about, I can't remember the number, 9% of our wetland habitats remaining in New Zealand. Um, they are essential habitats and it's really vital that we retain them within the landscape. 
The proposals, though, uh, extend the definition of wetlands beyond what we've seen currently in regional plans. They're really broad, and they do pick up places now like seepage wetlands or wet gully heads, so we need to consider this. They require stock exclusion from those areas with a five metre setback or greater, and there's restrictions on the land use that you can undertake adjacent to those areas, such as vegetation clearance and earthworks. So I'd just encourage you to take a moment and go back and have a look at those provisions as well, or recommendations. So beef and lamb's main concerns, I suppose. Um, Beef and Lamb's supportive of risk-based frameworks. Uh, some of the activities we undertake um, are supportive of like a higher level of scrutiny around them. However, we feel that these proposals miss the mark in relation to addressing the environmental effects. They're not effects-based in all instances. And really concerned about the inequality or inequity in some of these approaches. Obviously, we've talked a lot about grandparenting this evening, and that's some of the main concern, I think, that the sector has at the moment. The evidence that we looked at for Waikato, which had a similar suite of proposals, indicated that when you hold an extensive farming system to a low nitrogen leaching number, we, you prevented them from being able to reconfigure or change those farming systems. And then you included ongoing costs in relation to compliance, such as further fencing or reticulation. It really pushes the viability of those systems. And that's because they've already addressed a whole lot of environmental issues for, for a number of reasons, um, community reasons or um, personal circumstances or life choices, uh, just because that's how they choose to farm. And so when you're doing this, you're really impacting on the opportunity of those farming businesses uh, to be able to be future-proof moving forward and to be able to optimise those farming systems. And also because this essentially um, enables or continues to enable really intensive farming systems, it's unlikely that we'll see a marked difference in water quality in those areas that have the biggest impacts. The suite of proposals holding the line is really narrow in its focus. It just looks at water quality. It essentially assumes that water quality is bad everywhere, and we know that's simply not true. What we're supposed to be managing under the Resource Management and in the National Policy Statement is ecological health of fresh water and providing for wider values such as community values and cultural values. There's not this narrow focus on water quality. And what we know is that water quality isn't poor everywhere. It's variable across the country. We have large areas, especially in our upland or hill countries, where water quality is really good and that's reflected by healthy macroinvertebrate communities and healthy fish indices. Um, and then we have areas where we're getting certain impacts, but it's not impacted everywhere either. Uh, issues are specific to a certain region or location. These are some of the economic implications that we've seen. And over here, we've just got, I've just grabbed a graph of the local government New Zealand uh, um, picture that they had or, or pie graph that they had within the report. I know that there's ongoing work by regional councils to look at the cumulative impacts of the suite of proposals, not only at the farm level but at that broader level like community level and regional level. And so it'd be good to see where they, where they get to in relation to that analysis. And a, n a number of the sectors are also undertaking their own analyses like beef and lamb. We'll be able to provide that as soon as that's completed. Uh, under the local government, they showed a 68% reduction in land under dry stock farming. That's the orange area, essentially went into forestry. And that's because of the combination of the restrictions on land use change, restrictions on emissions, and then increased compliance cost on top of that. Uh, dairy and hort stay the same. Some of the costs from our Waikato study, so this was a similar sort of approach, grandparented nitrogen leaching imposed higher uh, costs in relation to compliance around some standards. Upfront capital costs are between 26,000 to 541,000 per farm. This is for hill country properties, so mixed systems, more diverse landscapes, so um, more challenging in relation to some of the mitigation. <coughs> Ongoing annual costs are between 5,000 to 70,000 per farm. And the opportunity cost of imposing nitrogen limits ranging between 75,000 and 256,000 per farm. So really significant. The opportunity costs, these weren't farms configuring or changing the system from 9 kg to a 50 kg. These were tiny, tiny changes in that range. So from memory, I think it was some farm systems just changing the nitrogen leaching by a couple of points. And what we know is this is not, doesn't result in those changes in water quality. It, it's through a model called Overseer. And what we also know through the model is that um, it's the, the inaccuracies associated with the dry stock or more extensive farming on more diverse landscapes are higher. I'm just going to quickly do a sprint through the, ch the proposed changes to the National Policy Statement. This won't take me too long. So the National Policy Statement essentially sets uh, values 
uh, and a framework that regional councils go through to manage, uh, uh, manage fresh water or manage ecological health in New Zealand. They're proposing a number of changes here, and I just want to talk to you about uh, four key ones, I think, in particular. So they're proposing new environmental bottom lines for nitrogen, uh, and for suspended sediment, and for phosphorus, uh, and they're also proposing some new uh, like attributes or outcomes for, for more integrated measures of, of ecological health, such as bug community health and, and fish health as well. The first one is suspended sediment. So these proposals, they are tailored to the type of water body that you, that you uh, have that, where this number applies. And we know we've got a number of different water bodies in New Zealand, right? So you've got gravel bottom water bodies, you've got mud bottom waterways, um, and the, you've got systems draining into different environments. So this takes it into account the differences in the geology and the character of those water bodies. It also takes into account natural background processes, and it tries to just essentially set limits or changes um, which are due to anthropogenic impacts or the impacts of, of, um, of people within that landscape and potentially farming activities as well. So there's some good stuff there, but it's still an environmental bottom line. And what that means for regional councils, or what we need to consider, is that regional councils will then grab the numbers, they'll look at their waterways across the catchment, they'll pick the appropriate waterway and the appropriate number that they think that's appropriate, and they'll use that and it will identify catchments that are at risk for erosion. So Rangitiki catchment springs to mind in the Manawatu. Um, I think you've got some sort of at risk probably catchments up here. And what that will mean is that the regional council will set some new environmental bottom lines and then they'll target target their management responses to those at-risk catchments. So you could see through this approach more stringent controls on land use and, and land use activities, farming activities. So that's the implication. What we know is some of the best ways to manage a risk of erosion or sediment is through tailored land and environment plans. I can talk to you a little bit about Horizon Sustainable Land Use Initiative, which I think is, is at the forefront of what um, successful management of erosion risk catchments looks like. The SLUI approach in the Horizons region is completely voluntary. Um, it's supported by the farmers and also supported by regional rates and, and, a government, and government as well. Uh, we know that last year alone, those farmers within that catchment, I think, uh, forked out about 27 million out of their own pockets in relation to erosion management. And the modelled outcomes from that SLUI project that's been running over the last decade in particular is about a 47% reduction in sediment levels in the Rangitiki catchment. So an effective, effective approach. Um, but land and environment plans are tailored to the farm and they're in the catchment context. They don't have the draconian requirements that the freshwater module to the farm plan is proposing. They're a different instrument. Also what they're proposing, and I think this has been getting quite a bit of media attention, and definitely attention in, in Parliament or in the House, is a new environmental outcome for nitrogen. At the moment, the national policy statement has a, an outcome for nitrogen based on toxicity. I think the lower, the environmental bottom line is something like 6.9. This is proposing a new environmental bottom line of one, about one milligram per litre, so significantly less than that. And this is likely to have implications for, for areas where we've got more intensive land uses and potentially more, vulner, more vulnerable soils or, or higher rainfall. So this is just a map showing some of those hot spots of, of where they're exceeding that one milligram per litre um, proposed environmental bottom line. So it really picks up Canterbury in particular, parts of Otago and parts of Southland, um, areas in the Manawatu, areas in the Waikato and a few hot spots in, in Northland. So it's quite tailored to this. We need to also be cognizant, though, that the current national policy statement has a requirement to manage you know, the algal growth in our rivers. Uh, we know that two key ways we can manage algal growth is through controlling nutrients. So there is already an existing uh, freshwater outcome in the national policy statement in relation to algal growth that requires more stringent uh, nutrient management than, than the 6.9 in the... Uh, in relation to toxicity. And I can talk a little bit about that, it gets confusing, but I just sort of wanted to be clear there. So again, like sediment, what this means is that regional councils will go through a process of looking at their waterways, of setting an environmental bottom line in relation to those waterways in consultation with their communities, but you cannot, uh, you cannot set an environmental bottom line below the proposed one milligram, for example. 
Um, and then they'll set management frameworks on the land in order to, to show how they're going to meet that environmental bottom line. In places like Canterbury, from all the evidence that I've seen, it will mean significant land use change. Application of good management practice alone in places like Canterbury will not be sufficient to achieve those in-stream numbers. It also talks to current, current conversations that we're having around allocation. Essentially, if you make the bucket smaller, then it pinches everybody that's within that catchment if they want to use part of that bucket. So the smaller the bucket, the smaller the number is to go around for us to use, the more tensions that you have within communities about how to use that. So the other requirements or things that they're putting in the national policy statement or recommending to be changed um, seem pretty pragmatic actually. The, the more integrated measures of, of ecological health are so really appropriate. They're looking at essentially environmental bottom lines for how healthy our bug communities are. They're a good indicator of, of ecological health, how healthy that system is. Uh, they're thinking about having metrics for um, fish community health um, and also you know, plant growth, especially in relation to our lakes. And what's proposed is that if the environmental bottom line essentially breached, then there's not a large regulatory stick. The regional council then just needs to work with their communities to develop an action plan to address some of those issues. However, the government's also proposing new E. coli metrics for swimmability. We know that there's issues in relation to the use of E. coli as a measure of pathogenic risk. So this would be something that I'd ask you to turn your minds to. They're really stringent and from our experience across the country are going to be extremely hard to meet. Um, and they're not necessarily linked to the risk that we're trying to manage for, which is um, human health in relation to primary contact recreation. It's a very poor proxy of risk. So the suite of proposals are significant and they are likely to cause significant land use change across New Zealand. In relation to the primary industries, my understanding is that we're all supportive of addressing environmental issues, uh, but doing so in a way that provides for community well-being and the vibrancy of our pastoral agricultural sector in particular. We know that you can put policy in place which achieves those multiple outcomes. The question is really whether this suite of proposals does that. And from the analysis that we've seen, there's some significant concerns there. So the consultation time frame is pretty tight. It's about six weeks. So submissions are due on the 17th of October. MFE's running roadshows around the country at the moment, so I encourage you to get along to those roadshows. Beef and Lamb will also be running roadshows and will be taking farmers in a, in a more slow, slower way, I suppose, through some of the details of the proposals that impact the sector or that farmers are concerned about. There's resources that can be found on the MFE website and Beef and Lamb's developing its resources. We've already got resources up there um, and we're constantly evolving them as more information comes and we've got the time to actually put out fact sheets as well. You've got some of those fact sheets in front of you on the table this evening. Uh, Beef and Lamb's working with the other primary industries to unpick these proposals and see if there's a common ground that can be found and a common voice to the government to put forward pragmatic solutions to the issue that the government wants to address in New Zealand and the wider New Zealand public wants to address. We will be making a submission. We're undertaking more research to look at the cumulative impacts of these suite of proposals, and not only on our farming business, but also on the rural communities. And we're encouraging farmers to understand what these proposals say and to get involved. I agree with Rick that it's time to amplify our voice in this space. I think the red meat sector in particular has been quiet and it's time to stand up and be heard. I think it's critical that we make a submission. You don't necessarily need to make a submission as an individual that I'd encourage you to and we're here to help you through that process. But community submissions are also extremely powerful and I know that here today we've got a number of um, farmer leaders that are involved in community catchments and so engaging with that community and putting in a, a group submission is also a good idea. Contact your local MP. Uh, this uh, could be uh, not only a government issue uh, at the national level, but also a regional election issue. And if you've got case studies, then please share them. We encourage you to think about the implications of the suite of proposal and put forward information within your submission that backs up the changes that you want to see. Thanks. That's all from me.